The Gullies of Wake. My name is Leah Zaisi, and I'm here with Dan Cornelius from Intertribal Agriculture Council. And today we're going to talk about cooperatives in Indian Country. So, um, just to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about, we'll start out with the market potential of co ops, how they work, a few examples of co ops from around Indian Country, some models and marketing strategies, and then how you can start one. So I want to start off of just talking about some big picture numbers. According to the 2017 USDA Ag Census, there were almost 80,000 Native American farmers and ranchers doing on, uh, on 60,000 farms doing roughly $3.4 billion in sales. And you know, that number is big. That number does not even account for our tribal fishers and the dollars of um, of those sales. And when we were, um, we were doing a, a project on cooperative development a couple of years ago, and as we were working on the application, I was trying to quantify of, of the potential and the impact of capturing more value added dollars with our, with our production. And I kind of talked to USDA and they didn't really have the more refined numbers, but I just looked at, at the aggregate, at the big picture. And so what you see on, uh, on the right of your screen here is just a comparison of Native American farmers and ranchers versus Asian American and Hispanic farmers ranchers. We're in green and then, uh, I'm sorry, we're in, we're in red and then the, the Asian American farmers ranchers are in green. And so what these graphs depict is that we have there's one third the number, the total number of Asian American farmers and ranchers on one thirtieth the amount of land, yet they're doing double the annual sales. And you know, so you think of, of, of why is that? And there are a lot of different reasons. Some of it is proximity to market. Some of it is, uh, is infrastructure. Um, there's, there's some other reasons as well. But in the big picture of, of why is cooperative development important? What opportunities can it provide? Part of what we're going to talk about today is how it can provide the opportunity to realize the economy of scale to overcome some of the barriers and obstacles that we face in capturing more of those dollars. So as we move on to the next slide, um, you know, of, of, of what, are, what are some of those market opportunities? What is the market potential? Um, according to, uh, to the National Indian Gaming Association, in 2018, there was $33.7 billion in casino revenue. Now, NIGA does not publish food service numbers, but in doing, some, uh, in doing some research, the Nevada Gaming Control Board and UNLV's Center for Gaming Studies had found that 22% of total revenue of the Vegas casinos is food service. So you correlate that out to you know, what, what does that translate to for our tribal casinos? That's seven point four billion dollars a year. Now let's say you know let's say maybe that number is a bit high. Even if we go conservative and at eleven percent of our total casino revenue, at eleven percent, that still is three point five billion dollars, which coincidentally is the same amount of our total ag sales for all Native American farmers and ranchers. So, you know, providing some of these numbers to really to think about the, uh, the opportunity and you think about the a, as a whole, the opportunity that we have throughout our tribal economies and food economies to capture more of those dollars. Now, look at the federal nutrition dollars that are coming in and we'll talk about that more later, but we've got roughly $150 million a year coming in through the commodity food distribution program. And we have some examples of success in capturing more of those dollars. But from the big picture potential, and why is this important? Uh, we've got a, a graph here of the 10-year cattle prices. And um, this is, uh, only goes through 2017. But you, know, you, look, you, know, you, look, you look at those prices. And you know, what you see at the peak of that graph is our native ranchers getting $1,400, $1,500 per calf in the fall. You know, last year, looking around seven, maybe a little bit more than $700. This year, we may be looking at 550, 600, if that. 
And so when you're trying to plan for, for a business and trying to project out your, 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 uh, your cash flow and your balance sheets and trying to make sure that you can cover your loan expenses and your operational expenses, it's difficult when you're at the complete mercy of the market when you're, when you're solely in the commodity market. So, you know, again, of, of looking at how can we capture more of, of those dollars and the opportunity that cooperative development can provide is the ability to get an economy of scale of getting a larger number of producers working together to have uh, common investments in infrastructure and to build up the numbers that we can be, uh, th that we can be capturing more of those casino dollars and the other market opportunity. Uh, the last thing that I would like to talk about on this slide is looking at, um, at the four tiers of the global food system. So what this figure right here is depicting is um, as you look at that is that outer ring of, of the red, of the global, um, you know, of the global aggregated uh, food distribution system. So these are the grain elevators that we see in our communities. These are the stockyards. That, uh, that our calves go to in Nebraska and Kansas and Oklahoma and elsewhere. You know, that's that, that's that big global food system. You move in to the orange. That is, you know, that's the Cisco, that's the, you know, those are the trucks that are coming in and, uh, you know, and in, in servicing our casinos and our larger restaurants. You start moving in and you get to, uh, and, and you're getting to more of some of the larger co-ops. The farther in that you get on, on, on this chart, generally, the more dollars that you're gonna have that are gonna be staying with the producers. So, you know, think about, about this graph and the more that we can expand the personal production of our hunting, our gardening, uh, our community production, and, um, you know, and, and then con concentrically building those circles out, that's more dollars that's gonna be staying in our communities versus right now, almost all of our production is in that outer ring and we're not capturing those, those food dollars. So I yeah, wanna, wanna quickly address some myths of, of co-ops. A co-op is a business. And part of why we have this slide here, this is from a, a farmer's market and selling your tomatoes at, at $1 a pound. I know it's uh, you know that's the challenge of you hit uh, around me you hit late summer early fall everybody's got tomatoes and uh, it's it's hard to break even selling at at one dollar a pound but you know that that myth that uh, you know is is really we need to to keep that in mind that a co-op is a business and although there are principles that state that every member of a co-op has a vote still that co-op is gonna be run by, uh, you know, it, overseen by a board of directors, but that it is gonna have uh, staff that run the day-to-day -day of it. And if it's not able to break even, if it's not able to run a successful business, then, it, you know, in the long run, it, it's not gonna be a successful endeavor. So, um, you know, so that's, that's one, of the, one of the big considerations that we wanna really emphasize from the beginning. And uh, there's different models of co-ops that we're gonna be talking about, but you know, at the, at the end of the day, it's a business, but that business is owned by its members. It's owned by the producers, or in the case of multi-stakeholder cooperatives, it's owned by the producers and other members of that cooperative. So we wanted to give you a few examples of co-ops that you might already shop at without realizing that you're shopping at a co-op, um, and some of the bigger names in cooperative businesses. So these are a few different um, sectors that co-ops operate in. Um, the lower left is a co-op grocery store that you may have visited. Um, Ace Hardware is actually a um, hardware and lumber cooperative. Health Partners is a health cooperative. And then Organic Valley is a producer cooperative um, that started with dairy farmers and it has now expanded to be pretty big. And you can see these annual revenues uh, are pretty substantial. So sometimes people associate cooperatives with meaning that you're less competitive, but um, these are showing that you're, you can actually be very competitive um, and become quite a large business as a co-op. And then as far as co-ops go, um, you can see that agriculture is really bringing in the majority of the revenue um, in the cooperative sector. So that's um, 116 billion, and that was in 2016. 
So underpinning all of these um, cooperatives that operate are these seven cooperative principles. Voluntary and open membership, meaning that anybody can sort of get involved and become a member. Um, although sometimes cooperatives set up um, essentially a, a practice year or um, an apprenticeship year to, to make sure that incoming members really jive with the existing co-op and are gonna be good um, productive members of the cooperative. Uh, democratic member control, meaning that the members make a lot of the decisions in a cooperative and each member has a vote in that. Economic participation, meaning that members are really the drivers of how successful the cooperative is going to be. Um, and then autonomy and independence, being able to act as its own entity, as a cooperative, and then also the individual members being able to make own decisions on their own farms. Um, education, training, and information are very common aspects of cooperatives, not just within the cooperative and providing education and training it, um, opportunities for the members, but also um, working with other cooperatives to provide those opportunities and help other cooperatives out, which brings us to cooperation among cooperatives. Um, and we'll talk more about that later, about how you can find a local cooperative and they may be willing to help you sort of navigate those initial steps that can be kind of challenging. Um, and then having a concern for the community, having an investment in the community, really putting the people of the co-op and their community members at the heart of the decision making so that the co-op is a good community member um, and is really benefiting the community as a whole. So um, I just want to talk about how those guiding principles get put into work. And so in a typical producers cooperative where farmers are coming together, they're aggregating their products. So they have a raw product. Um, they might be just producing corn, for example, um, or like for a maple syrup producers cooperative, they may just be harvesting sap and then processing it together. Um, but either way, they're aggregating that supply to a greater amount that they would be able to do individually. Um, and so that's what allows them to sell under one label. Um, potentially access bigger markets and bargain for better prices. Along with that, um, operating as a group and working together is bringing down the costs um, and helping people reach different certifications. So um, the Food Safety Modernization Act, the Produce Safety Rule is impacting a lot of mid-sized farms right now. Um, coming together as a cooperative is a good way to share costs in getting um, the audits that are needed, make, making sure that you're in compliance with regulations um, sharing costs like insurance and things like that. Um, and like I mentioned before, processing, um, having a group that can pool um, their, their capital and search for other capital can be a really good way to get from producing a raw product to producing the value added product and starting to move outside in that circle that Dan was talking about. Um, you might also have uh, opportunities to share just um, experiences together. So we'll talk about a cooperative that is subsistence based and a lot of the members uh, spend time exchanging knowledge with each other, traditional knowledge, um, modern agricultural knowledge, but it's a really good way to start building relationships within the community, um, intergenerationally, in between different producers that are not um, competing anymore, they're working together and that can really strengthen relationships within the tribe or within the community that this cooperative is operating in. So um, let's just jump into some examples. That subsistence co-op that I was talking about is called Ohilagu. It's a co-op of 15 families on the Oneida Reservation in Wisconsin. Um, and they got started in 2016 and they actually incorporated as an agricultural nonprofit. So they're not incorporated as a co-op per se, but they operate as a co-op, as a group of people who make decisions together, who share costs and then share in the harvest. So the harvest is divided up equally amongst the members based on how many hours were put in in producing the corn. Um, they grow an ancestral corn that is um, uh, their heritage, part of their traditional ways. Um, and then they also put aside a share for the community. So that's part of that community involvement, making sure that the co-op is being a good community member and acting in the best interest of the community. Um, and so far they've been able to grow 17,000 pounds of corn together. Um, and that would be something that 15 families individually would be able to do in their own backyards, but working together on just a few acres, they're able to really increase their production um, and really incorporate more traditional foods into their diet and um, participate more in bartering with neighboring tribes and even other community members. 
so looking at some examples of you know what are what are what are some other tribal cooperatives um you know one of one of the big examples that uh that is not necessarily a business but a cooperative effort is the native farm bill coalition and where we had uh 78 tribes and um 140 something um overall tribes that had participated in that Native Farm Bill Coalition is part of the reason why we had 63 tribal oriented provisions in the 2018 Farm Bill. So that's an example on more of the political side of the power of, of working together and working cooperatively. But an example from, uh, from the agricultural side is San Javier uh, Cooperative Farm in Arizona. Uh, San Javier is a, it's a great, uh, I think it's a great model that they have a focus on both production agriculture, but they also have a huge focus on traditional foods. So you see here the picture of Choya cactus buds. It's very hard for a single, um, for a single individual to be able to produce enough Choya cactus buds or, or even wild rice or some of our other traditional foods to really have enough of a supply to make available uh, on a market basis, whether that be to other tribal members or, uh, or beyond. So San Javier has been able to, uh, to use this cooperative model, not only to support uh, expanded uh, marketing and distribution, but they also have been able to, to use it to support expanded production and they're growing chemical free hay and uh, in, in other crops in Southern Arizona and helping to bring, helping to make it easier for, uh, for farmers and landowners to, to maintain viable agricultural businesses. And they are a tribally chartered organization. So next we wanna welcome Rowan White, who's gonna talk to us a little bit about how Sierra Seeds works. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, sego, seguego. Uh, my name is Rowan White. I'm from the Mohawk community of Aquasosne, uh, currently farming uh, in Northern California. And um, I'm the founder and educational director of uh, the Sierra Seed Cooperative. Um, we founded uh, Sierra Seeds uh, over 10 years ago uh, with a vision for um, basically a, an, a, an experiment or a uh, uh, an inquiry into what does it look like to um, support and um, and focus on uh, seed sovereignty as a part of any local food movement, right? We we have a lot of 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 work that's you know shortening the supply chain to uh, increase local foods ending up on tables in communities, and what it has always been uh, a question for me is where does seed production uh, and seed accessibility in a community come in? And so we founded Sierra Seed Cooperative on the foundation that, um, that we can't have truly local food if we don't also have truly local seed and that, um, uh, that a cooperative model uh, that's rooted in, in sort of this regenerative economic principle of uh, cooperation uh, would be uh, the right way to go. Um, so our cooperative is focused on seed production, um, and it's it's rooted in a very specific bioregion, which is in the the watershed or seed shed that we're in here in um, Northern California, um, just outside of Sacramento. Um, our guiding principles of our cooperative um, is around regional adaptation, so uh, ensuring that it's basically a regional seed hub, ensuring that the seeds that are distributed and and produced uh, underneath the umbrella of our cooperative um, are uh, regionally adapted uh, and therefore offer uh, the resilience um, that that regional adaptation and diversity um, offers uh, when we have when we have locally uh, accessible seed. We also have been striving towards uh, relevance, both cultural relevance and environmental relevance. What are the foods and seeds that are um, that are being um, asked for and that are culturally uh, relevant in our region. Uh, and then the, the, the other guiding principle for the cooperative was education uh, and relationship building. So how are we connecting the dots in our local region um, to ensure that the farmers know where their seeds come from uh, and that there's an overall commitment from our cooperative towards seed literacy in the community of why 
uh, having regionally produced and um, you know regionally adapted seeds is a critical part of any durable sustainable uh, local food system and so for me uh, this was um, an endeavor that started uh, with a seed swap I, I came to this region um, as a transplant from the northeast and wanting to uh, get a sense of who was doing seed work in the region and, and also um, what what was the conversation around seed um, as it related to local food and so we hosted a seed swap and kind of pulled together the people who were most interested in making um, a larger contribution to uh, seed sovereignty and seed security in, in the watershed. Um, and so it ended up becoming, um, we actually also formed as a nonprofit as opposed to um, an LLC or a, a formal cooperative um, because that gives us a lot of leeway in supporting the work we do here. Um, but it, it does, we are a growers cooperative so so we are focused on helping to support and sustain the integration of seed production as a part of diversified regional farms so our grow our cooperative members are um, um, csa farmers our gardeners our um, flower farmers they they do a lot they produce a lot of um, various um, products and and foods for our region and, and so this was to create economic incentive for those who were wanting to uh, re, um, re-establish a relationship with seed stewardship within their, their overall farming system. And the way that we support our growers in our cooperative is to provide um, that economic incentive. So um, having seed co contracts that are drafted and developed so that it supports and you know offers them an economic an economic stipend to support their seed growing efforts. Um, it also we also provide extension report uh, support and seed mentorship um, for those who are just kind of perhaps cutting their teeth on the skills of of seed stewardship as a part of a diversified farm. Um, and then we also support our 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 circle of growers through the use of communal seed cleaning tools. Um, and we also have uh, a scholarship fund that supports uh, seed education in the region for those growers to continue to become better at what they do. Um, and so really the heart of what we do is we talk about, you know, CRC's mission is to grow good seed stewards. Um, and we know that this, um, this will, uh, I'll continue to share a little bit about what we do and then kind of the seeds of CRC's and how that's impacted some work in Indian country. Um, so the strength of the cooperative is in our shared, mostly, I mean, most of our growers are um, not only encouraged by the economic incentive, but also um, the shared tools and infrastructure. So we have a, a mobile seed processing unit that's able to go from farm to farm around the community that um, would be quite a barrier for anyone who, um, who any individual farm to, to invest in tools like that. We have a fanning mills and um, a stationary plot thresher um, and some other uh, low tech tools and high and, and um, an air column uh, seed separator that helps to help people when they're processing uh, their seed crops. Um, we also pool uh, together these lots of seed to distribute them. Um, some of the work that we do is, is wholesale. So some of those seeds go to other efforts where seed is distributed, but largely the seed is, is shared in the community. Um, and this creates more biodiversity in the seed shed by, by sharing more seeds because really we use community as a seed stewardship tool. Um, because if any one of those farmers, we have uh, 20, uh, 20 members in our growers cooperative, if any one of them um, were growing, you know, 200 plus seeds that we would have in our, in our seed list, that would be extremely difficult. Um, but in our in our member co-op, if each person or farm entity is taking on growing 10 of those varieties, um, then it's fairly easy to get to, to 200 um, varieties, which increases the resilience in a, a food shed or a seed shed um, of having the number of varieties, um, of that many number of varieties uh, available uh, for folks to use uh, and, and share in our community. Um, and so this model was really, I guess I, I said at the beginning, sort of an experiment for me. Um, I uh, have a deep commitment to supporting uh, the seed sovereignty work and the indigenous food sovereignty uh, movement. 
And um, and so I have I am one of, of many founding members of the Indigenous Seakeepers Network, which is an offshoot of the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. And really what that uh, initiative um, is focused on is to support the seed sovereignty efforts um, that, that are happening all across Turtle Island. And so founding CR Seeds and having a decade long experiment of working within a local food system to see how seeds can play a role and how there can be a regenerative economic model that um, not only is a way to distribute seeds in a region um, and to de decrease dependency on sort of the one size fits all seeds that comes from, you know, these large wholesale seed companies, um, but also to think about ways we can create um, economic opportunities for our farmers and gardeners in a way, in a model, in a cooperative model that aligns with cultural values um, and, and ways in which that this model can be adopted in Indian country at the local tribal level and also at the regional level. So we're taking a lot of what we've learned uh, through Sierra Seed Cooperative um, and using it in the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network to support sustained efforts towards uh, regional uh, seed cooperative development. So creating these indigenous seed hubs uh, in specific regions and helping to empower and uplift um, and mentor uh, local um, and lo local tribal uh, seed projects and initiatives to perhaps um, uh, either build their own cooperative or join uh, a regional effort. So um, that's really the work that um, you know, that we've done there. We've gotten creative a little bit with our uh, customer membership um, in ways that help bring seed literacy into our community, including um, we host a, what we call a seed CSA. So CSA is community supported agriculture. And we've taken that model for seeds. So we created an annual seed subscription of seeds and educational materials that help elevate the home garden experience for people in our region. So people are getting bundles of seed that correlate with the different seasons and what they could plant um, and really learning um, how to grow uh, good food for their family uh, in their community. So uh, we've, uh, it's been quite, uh, quite a fun endeavor. Uh, we've, we've uh, learned a lot along the way um, and, and, and really it's helped us to illuminate kind of the next steps in continuing to cultivate local seed sheds, not only where I live, um, but across uh, Indian country um, to, because what we've learned a lot, we've learned a lot in the process of, of, of cooperative development, knowing that, um, which has, is evolving into a, a toolkit that will be available through Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, uh, which is called the Seed Sovereignty Assessment Toolkit, which is basically a way in which a community can engage in uh, seed census work um, in identifying kind of their seed blue, um, footprint um, of the seeds that exist in one community and also the seed needs in a community and identifying ways to scale up uh, appropriately um, in a community to ensure seed security for uh, the next generation. So I'm a huge advocate for uh, the cooperative model as it relates to seeds, um, because I feel like, you know, for many of us, uh, we don't necessarily, uh, as Indigenous peoples, um, might not always, uh, uh, many people don't agree with uh, commodifying or selling uh, sacred seeds, but when we distribute them through a cooperative model, we can, uh, we have the capacity um, to uh, build a, a regenerative Indigenous economic model um, that isn't rooted in extraction or exploitation, but actually is rooted in, as Leah was mentioning, community care, getting seeds out to, to into the hands of people who need them, um, being able to provide um, economic support for um, those folks doing it. And that's why we've actually, we advocate for uh, the nonprofit cooperative model, and because we've also been able to fundraise and grant raise to be able to supply uh, seed stipends and other things that create that economic incentive um, and not always just focusing on uh, on the sale of seeds. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about CR Seeds and about Indigenous Seed Keepers Network. So I think that I'll wrap that up um, there. And if folks have questions later, I'd be happy to, um, to, to, to answer them. Awesome, thank you so much, Rowan. So yeah, my pleasure. Uh, all of those things sound pretty cool. Um, we're gonna talk about how to start a co-op if you're interested. So first you're gonna go out and identify the problem or opportunity. So it might be 
that you're concerned about the availability of seeds and the knowledge about seed saving in a community like Rowan. Um, it could be that you're concerned about people having the know-how to grow their own food like folks are at Ohilagu, or you might be interested in economic development like San Javier Co-op. Either way, you're gonna focus in on that problem or that opportunity that you see um, and get together with a group of people that you think can help make you happen, um, make it happen. And so that would be a steering committee, typically a group that's gonna get together and meet and brainstorm and figure out how to tackle this problem. Um, that steering committee might go ahead and launch a feasibility study. Um, you may not need a feasibility study. You may already know certain things um, and you may not be trying to access a market necessarily. So this step is um, definitely one that you're gonna consider whether or not you're gonna go um, the economic development route or if you're gonna go more of a community development route or a blend of both. Um, when you go after this feasibility study piece, there are resources out there to help you um, pay for a consultant to help you do that and if, you, if you're not gonna do it yourself. Um, and then once you have that feasibility study in hand, you decide, okay, we're gonna do this, that's when you go, would go ahead and incorporate. You may incorporate as a cooperative, you may incorporate as a nonprofit, as Rowan did and as Ohilaku did. Um, and that nonprofit route would be more if you're looking at having an educational piece that you're gonna be going after grants to um, provide. If you're looking at the economic development side, you'd really be looking at more of a, a cooperative incorporation or an LLC, um, probably a cooperative though. Um, and that's when you start adopting and writing your bylaws um, and getting, uh, doing a membership drive and getting people involved. Um, and along with that will be the business plan for the direction that you're gonna take the cooperative, what kind of markets you're gonna access, um, how many members you need to get there, um, all of those good things. Um, get those members involved. So in, in doing an equity drive with members, that means basically you're inviting people in to become members of the cooperative they're gonna pay a fee, a membership fee, to join the cooperative to get the benefits of the co-op. You may not have a community that can pay a high fee, and that's okay because there's other ways to raise capital for a co-op. Um, and that would be done by a board of directors, and they're gonna go out and look for startup capital. And there are actually um, capital funding streams specifically for cooperatives, if you're incorporated as a formalized cooperative, that you can access um, once you've gone through those steps. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then you just start opening doors for business, hiring staff so they can get the operations up and running, you know, potentially infrastructure, potentially equipment, those kinds of purchases um, once you've raised that capital. And then you're rocking and rolling. So just a little note on incorporating. Um, the incorporation is going to provide you an opportunity to really craft the cooperative to the needs of the producers that you're working with. It's also an opportunity to in, in, um, infuse your values and your cultural perspectives into how the business is going to operate. So there's uh, ways to make sure that your bylaws are culturally relevant and that are gonna work with the people that are in your cooperative. Um, and that's a really good opportunity to essentially form a business around what your cultural values are, what your community's values are, um, to really do the best good in your community that you can do. Um, typically when you incorporate, you'll go through your state. Some tribes do offer uh, cooperative um, filing that you can do. So that'll be something that you would check in with your tribe on. If your tribe doesn't have that, it's part of a model food code project that the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative is working on. So if that's something that you want to move forward in your community, that's a good resource to access with that. Um, and then you'll develop the policies and control side um, that goes along with um, once you have those bylaws set. And that just makes sure that everybody's on the same page, there's good communication about how membership is going to work, um, how, what the checks and balances are going to be, um, what the personnel policies are, and what the policies are for the board, making sure that those two roles are really clarified so that the staff and the board are working together instead of stepping on each other's toes. So how do you make sure that you're a successful cooperative? Um, use outside expertise effectively. So we're gonna get into all those resources that you can access. IEC is one of those resources. So as technical assistant specialists, Dan and I are here to help you walk through this process as a cooperative. 
there are TAs all throughout Indian country. So there's somebody in your region um, who's willing to help you walk through that. There's also cooperative development centers and we'll get through a whole list of resources later. Um, keep your members informed of developments, of regulations, of opportunities, all those kinds of things. Conduct effective meetings, so make sure that you're being efficient with people's time. Um, you're getting things done in your meetings, setting agendas, those kinds of things. Define the roles and responsibilities of the board and management, which I talked about a little bit to make sure that people aren't stepping on each other's toes. Following sound accounting practices, because you are a business, so you're going to have to pay taxes on those revenues and make sure that you have all of that um, accounted for and make sure that the folks who are members of the cooperative are getting their fair share of the revenue that's coming in. Um, and then partner up with other co-ops. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for cooperation between cooperatives. It's a cooperative principle that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. Um, and it's a really good way to learn other people's mistakes without having to make them on your own. Um, and then make sure that the policies are clear on what is confidential co-op business and what a conflict of interest is so that you don't get into any hairy situations with your members. So some areas to avoid, um, having an unclear mission, purpose, and focus, um, lacking, um, lacking leadership and commitment. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of the, the big challenges is that when you're recruiting that steering committee, when you're recruiting your leadership, recruiting people who are, are going to put the time in to making it work, and especially for any organization getting, getting started and getting up off the ground, you know, oftentimes the, that, that first board of directors, that first leadership group, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be typically volunteers and you're going to be leaning on them for a lot of support and leadership and connecting, uh, connecting to their networks and resources. Um, you know, some other issues that, uh, that we've seen over the years are you know, inadequate feasibility studies and business plans that just, uh, that, that just don't work. And one of the things that I think you've kind of heard is a little bit of a theme throughout this, uh, this webinar today is, um, you know, we, we're talking on one hand about businesses and uh, in, informal cooperatives, but we're also talking about cooperative efforts and, you know, that, that may be you know, maybe organized as a nonprofit. And, uh, you know, that it's part of the challenge of that a lot of the work that we do, whether it's through, um, w whether it's through um, 501c3 nonprofits and applying for grants or uh, grants from the federal government, or whether it is operating as a cooperative business is, we're walking a, a line that is really set by the federal government and the IRS through the tax code, well, Congress, and then implemented through the tax code. So, you know, so that can be a challenge there of, uh, you know, are you a business or, or a nonprofit? And uh, you know, oftentimes you can accomplish similar objectives with both, but then it comes back to what is that, what is that clear mission, purpose, and focus? And then the failure to use experienced advisors and consultants. You know, it's, it's important to, uh, to have, you know, reach out and find those advisors, find the, that mentorship and support where it is available and make sure that you use it. And then for, you know, and then having competent management is always key for any effort. We'll move on to the next slide. Um, and then it is also do want to mention then the in a, you know, of course, financing, you know, and this is financing for any, uh, for, for, for any effort, uh, you know, even if you're a nonprofit, you need to have, a, you need to have a business plan or an organizational model that is going to allow you to operate on an economically sustainable basis. So, uh, you know, so that's just something for, for any organization and then making sure that you, uh, you avoid poor communication and, and, uh, and maintain good communication and developing the plans and the protocols to be able to make that happen. So I want to quickly talk about what are some examples of successful co-ops? Where has this worked? And uh, these are some examples from the region that I cover, which is the Great Lakes region. And I'm going to start off with, uh, with an organization called Organic Valley. And 
You know, I know if I go into um, to an Albertsons in Cup Bank, Montana, I'm going to see or, an Organic Valley product on that shelf. And Organic Valley originated in southwest Wisconsin in the 1980s of um, a similar time of a difficult time for agricultural producers. And, um, and at that point, the dairy farmers were either going big or, uh, or, or, or they were going out of business. And Organic Valley was an effort to help to support those, those small family farms by, in, by allowing them to work together with one another to increase the overall supply of product and then to brand it as, a, as an organic product and capture a higher value market. So, you know, they were getting three, four uh, plus times as much for their product as, uh, as, as conventional uh, milk producers were getting. And Organic Valley also then was able to add value through, um, you know, through butter, through, cheese, through cheeses, uh, through other dairy products, and then eventually expand into other production areas as well with, um, with beef and livestock, uh, vegetables, and even maple syrup. So an example of, uh, you know, in, in part, of the, part of why Organic Valley worked is that the, um, the barriers to entry into some of, uh, you know, in, into really develop, you know, refining milk, processing milk, it takes a lot of capital to be able to build those facilities. And by, by coming together, they were able to get past that infrastructure barrier that a lot of our producers face and, uh, and, and develop that value added product. A couple other examples, we have, um, we've got Fifth Season Cooperative, the same general area of, uh, of Southern Wisconsin and Fifth Season originated from the local, uh, the local hospitals were trying to source fresh produce. And they, they were having a hard time of going to 50 different, you know, 10 or 50 different small growers and you know all of the uh, the barriers of uh, food safety plans and, and everything they couldn't buy from 50 different growers so this idea for the cooperative came about in order to help to build a larger supply of product for those institutional buyers to uh, to be able to access and one of the innovative components of fifth season is that they're multi-stakeholder cooperative in addition to producers there are distributors and um, and processors and the customers that are that are all part of it, and each of those are a different class of membership. And uh, you know, so I think it highlights that that there you know that there are innovative approaches to um, to organizing and incorporating a co-op. The last one that I quickly want to address is the Wisconsin Food Hub Cooperative. Um, similar challenge of how. Uh, how to help producers get uh, get a fair price for their product, and that's where the the Wisconsin Food Hub Cooperative started, and with support from Wisconsin Farmers Union, was able to incorporate and get a warehouse, and um, and they're primarily doing fresh produce to the Milwaukee and Chicago markets. One of the issues that they ran into is that at harvest time, uh, when they needed to to send truckloads of produce to to market they weren't able to find the trucks because all those trucks all the other producers were needing them for whether it's potatoes or, or green beans is big in that area that all those trucks were were booked up so wisconsin food hub cooperative then got their own fleet of trucks and so they're an example of building that infrastructure and the model that they take is that they add a percentage of the overall sales onto um onto that purchase price to help to fund the operation. So a good example of a marketing and distribution cooperative. Now talk, I want to talk a little bit about marketing strategies. And you know, this goes beyond just, uh, just co-ops, but um, Intertribal Ag Council has the American Indian Foods Program. The American Indian Foods Program administers the Made and Produced by American Indians trademark that you see here. This is a, a no-cost program. There's a simple application on, uh, on the IndianAg.org website uh, for Intertribal Ag Council, and uh, you can apply. And uh, if, you know, if your application is accepted, which is a pretty straightforward application, you do need to, to actually you know, produce the product, but then you can use this trademark on your, uh, on your product it's available in, available in both a digital form 
and there are gold embossed stickers that you can uh, that you can stick onto a package so it's a great resource to be able to brand and market your product and set it apart from uh, from all those other products on the shelf and if you uh, if once you submit your trademark application and if it's accepted then you also are able to join the American Indian Foods program and part of what the American Indian Foods program does is it helps producers access export markets uh, you can see this is a booth at the at the National Restaurant Association show in Chicago and uh, typically the program will take between six and eight producers to uh, to these trade shows and just a great opportunity to not only be able to market your product but see some of what else is going on in uh, in the overall food service industry and we have some great leadership with the American Indian Foods Program with Latasha Redhouse and Courtney Fisher and they've actively been working over the last year to provide more support to uh, you know to not only focus on that export market but to focus domestically as well and, and and really helping how do you how do you develop a product and how do you scale up your business operations including right now when we've got some you know some difficult times of a lot of our producers markets have disappeared with uh, with the current covid crisis so what are some different options to be able to um, you know to build that capacity american indian foods program is doing great work there Another market uh, opportunity that I wanted to address, and I referenced it earlier, is federal procurement. So um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, with the, uh, the food distribution program on Indian reservations, AKA Kamab program, it's $145 million a year, plus there's been $5 million for traditional food purchases, and right now there's another $3 million for um, for direct purchasing through what is called a 638 authority. That refers to the tribe being able to administer the program directly. And in this instance, those tribal food distribution offices are going to be able to, uh, to access that money and to be able to buy direct from local producers. Uh, USDA is still working on the final rules to be able to make that happen. But that was one of the outcomes of the 2018 Farm Bill. So, you know, you imagine if, um, you know, with $3 million and if that, and that they're still figuring out exactly how it's going to work, but if each of the local offices who was interested had an additional $100,000 to be able to buy direct from local growers, that could have a big impact of supporting and expanding local production. Uh, the picture here, we've got wild rice. And uh, we had worked in 2015 and 2016 to get wild rice into that program. And, uh, and USDA uh, has bought uh, tens of thousands of pounds of hand harvested wild rice over uh, in now over the past four years. And they're paying a fair, a fair market value. The nice thing is that those dollars are going back to support individual harvesters. By, the, by raising the price of, of, uh, of the green rice, but they're also uh, helping those tribal programs that, uh, that, uh, that, that operate and, um, and process that rice at the same time as it's keeping the food within native communities. So that's an example. There are many other examples for federal procurement, but when we look overall at our tribal food economies and how much of those federal nutrition dollars are coming in, Almost all of it is supporting non-native production, and that's one of the big areas that Intertribal Ag Council is working on, is helping to capture more of those dollars and keeping that money in our communities, because every dollar that goes back to a local producer is gonna cycle back through the economy, depending on, 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 on how that economy is structured between five to six times. So, um... Jumping in now to resources that you can access to go from being an individual producer to being part of a cooperative. Um, there are a few different um, options that are out there for you. The first one would be the cooperative development centers. And there's a map here of the co-op centers that are operating in the US. There are almost 40 of them and they're operating in 26 states. So um, regardless of where you are, pretty much there is a cooperative development center that you can reach out to. Um, also remember to reach out to local co-ops. So the, um, the Center for Cooperatives at the University of Wisconsin has a list of all the cooperatives that they could find, um, and it's extensive. 
um, and you can find more on their website. We'll be sending out an email after this presentation to all of the attendees with all of these different links so you can go and explore these different options. Uh, we didn't want to crowd this up too much. Um, and then think about the USDA Value Added Producer Grant. Um, that's a grant that's available um, to help do those feasibility studies um, on the planning stage. And then there's also a second stage to that that allows you to go and actually buy supplies and put that feasibility study into action. So um, both Dan and I have helped folks uh, navigate the Value Added Producer Grant. There are, are other TAs on our staff that have also helped with that. So if you are interested or would like to hear more about that, uh, please reach out to one of us um, or go through our website to get in touch with us. I'd also like to briefly mention that we have an e-learning platform that's active right now. And there are a number of workshops on there, including one about cooperative development. You can get to that um, inter intertribal-agriculture-council.mn.co. So that's not a typo, it's just CO at the end there, not .com. Um, and there are a number of workshops on there. There's a mobile app that you can use um, to access that. And then there's also a website that you can go on to to get into that e-learning platform. And Leah, if I could also just add, um, so the USDA Value at a Producer Grant, that is run through USDA Rural Development. That's one of 17 different USDA agencies. Rural Development has additional grant programs that are targeted and, and, and open to cooperatives. So the Socially Disadvantaged Groups Grant is, is one of those. That's up to $175,000 for, uh, for that effort. And uh, as a cooperative, you can, uh, you can apply for it. They have some other cooperative development resources as well. So just wanted to mention, this is just a, a snapshot of some of what's out there. There are more resources too. And Intertribal Ag Council TA Network can help to connect with more of those. Yeah, absolutely. And this um, Center for Cooperatives webpage also has a list of um, cooperative funders. So um, funding institutions that are set up to help cooperatives um, access that capital. So um, look in your inbox for an email from us when you registered for the webinar. Um, it should have asked for your email and we'll be sending out a follow up to that. Um, we'll also be adding all of those resources into that um, Mighty Networks um, e-learning platform that you see the link for at the bottom there. So make sure you go and check out the cooperative development workshop in that one. With that, I want to say Yamanko. It's been a pleasure um, talking about cooperatives with you, and I hope that we brought some value to um, your exploration of what cooperatives are and how to start one. And with that, we'll open it for questions. Uh, Rowan, I have a question for you. When you were starting Sierra Seed Cooperative, um, you know. Um, W did you have kind of a steering committee or a, or a group, a core group that helped to provide some of the vision and leadership and getting it started? Yeah, yeah, um, we have, uh, uh, we had a, a core working group that kind of uh, wrote the bylaws and, and created sort of the initial um, documentation that we needed. And then We've had really good participation, um, you know, since then in terms of with the with the growers cooperative and we have annual meetings and then um, do that. And I've actually cycled out of being really in charge of any of the production. Like I just do educational. I do educational work with them now um, and, and do do grow seed as well. But, um, you know, we've cycled in some different leadership. So um, it's yeah, it's it's been a really wonderful uh, endeavor that I think, again, um, my experience with that, uh, I guess, just inspires me to see more cooperative development happening uh, at the local and regional level in Indian country. So, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. And it, it does look like we do have one question uh, in the chat box. Is there a common listing of native co-ops anywhere or by anyone? So we had done we had done um, background research and in, uh, in pulling a, a cooperative development project together, and um, we found a, we found extensive examples of cooperative efforts, but very few formally chartered tribal cooperatives. And uh, there there are some that that had been created and um, and and were disbanded or didn't quite get off the ground. 
but in terms of cooperative efforts, um, I mean, I know in the Pacific Northwest, there's some great examples up there of um, you know, Columbia River and Tribal Fish Commission has been working with the fish buyers and uh, providing education on food handling, providing overall support. And, um, you know, really, you know, that's a cooperative example, similar uh, up at Nisqually of the tribe helping to guarantee prices and working with, with the producers. And really across the board, there's lots of examples, um, but not an extensive list of formally uh, incorporated cooperatives yet. But we think that there's opportunity and hope to see that expanding in the near future. The other um, bigger cooperative that's out there that um, folks may not know is a cooperative is the Seminole uh, Tribes uh, Beef Program. They operate a co-op um, for all of their beef and they have the 10th largest cattle herd in the United States. So that's one example of cooperative uh, development really working for a tribal enterprise. Leah, do you remember when, when they were incorporated? It was quite a while ago. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been operating for some time. Um, and they've, they've had cattle there since before the United States was formed. So it's a big part of their history. Okay, great. Well, um, we're actually just at an hour right now. So perfect timing. Want to thank everyone for joining us today. This recording will be available on both the IAC YouTube channel, uh, Indian Ag on YouTube, and it's also going to be on our e-learning platform, Resiliency Through Agriculture. Again, as Leah mentioned, you can find that on, uh, on Mighty Networks, either the uh, uh, MightyNetworks.com through your web browser, or highly recommend downloading the mobile app. Pretty nice interface there. We got a lot of other content as well. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.